Hi, everybody. Welcome to my uh, National Open campaign. It's round number six. Uh, and in this round, I am taking on Nikolas Theodorou. He's a Greek international master, although with a rating of 2566 uh, and two uh, GM norms. He's basically a grandmaster. Um, he's in the States. He's studying at one of the colleges in the Midwest. Um, and he's playing chess, trying to become a GM, get a degree, get a high paying job, be awesome. Uh, and also, I, I know him because uh, he played Hikaru many, many times. So he's the famous Kriari, although that account on chess.com is closed. Um, uh, he closed it himself. That Nowadays, when an account is closed, it doesn't have a good, you know, but he closed his account. And so I, I used some of his accounts to prepare, but it was all kind of meaningless because recently he's been playing Knight F3. And I kind of expected him to play Knight F3. Uh, and I said I would play g6, and depending on what he did next, we would have a game. I just made this a course, okay, with g6. Um, so, you know, you should check it out. Link is in the description. Uh, and if he played like this, if he just didn't commit any of his center pawns, what I was going to do is I was going to play e5. And this was the extent of my preparation. He was going to play a King's Indian attack setup. So he's playing the King's Indian, but with the white pieces. And with black, the benefit of when your opponent commits to something like this, you can just play e5, d5. And that's generally considered the best way to handle this position. Now, up until this, I saw he had two recent games, one against Nizhnyuk. Actually, that was played like a month ago at Cherry Blossom, which is an over-the-board chess tournament. Um, and he had another one against... I, I mean, I don't remember his exact name, you know. Yeah, Greek, my Greeks, you know, y'all got, got a lot of consonants in, in those names. I think it's like Ioannidis. I think he's a Greek grandmaster. I could be completely mixing that up. And he played, both, both those games went e4. And both those grandmasters played knight f6. But here I saw a game, uh, Gelfand Giri from last year uh, in, uh, in the Skilling Open, prelims, I believe. And just very simple play. I was actually not, I didn't think he was going to do this because this just allows me to trade pieces and put my bishop on g4. I was like completely shocked he played into this. I suspected he didn't expect g6. I mean, I don't know. I didn't, we didn't really talk too much about the opening. Um, I don't know. I suspect my move order might have thrown him off. Like, I think if he had the option, he wouldn't have gone into this because it's so hard to outplay black in this position. I could be a total idiot, which I am. It's still very difficult because now he has to be responding to me. And I played knight f6. And this was still in my notes. And here Gelfand, Boris Gelfand, played this in a niche castled queenside. And this is what I was going to play. Um, but during the game, I was like, what if he plays h3? He just doesn't guard his center pawn. He counterattacks my bishop. And he did that. Um, and I was like, okay, now I'm on my own. Now, naturally, you want to go here because you actually don't want your bishop to get hit by the knight. But it's actually kind of funny. This is the best move. And this is what I played because if he attacks me, then I go here. And it's actually better for me to lure him to that square and then back up. This sometimes happens in positions. You can actually bait a knight to a square trying to take your bishop. And by the way, just in case you're wondering like why I would even move, because it's defended, it doesn't, right? it doesn't matter. I don't want to give up the bishop pair for no reason. The position is completely symmetrical. There's no need to just give him the bishop pair and damage my own pawn structure, doubling my e-pawns. So sometimes there's positions where this is actually good because now the knight is just a target and it will have to block the bishop from the defense of the pawn. So he didn't do that. He played knight d2. Um, I played h6, preventing knight g5, and he played bishop f1. And throughout the game, I'm already spending a lot of time in the opening. Um, here I castled queenside, so now, once again, I'm threatening this. And I was, like, in love with my position here. You know, I was like, okay, he's going to play rookie 1 to get out of the pin. Now I'm going to go knight d7 or knight c5 or knight d7 and knight b6. Then I'm going to, you know, double my rooks on the d file. I'm going to play f5 maybe further down the line. How is he ever going to get developed? And then here was my first, um, you know, it's the reason the video is called what it's called. Um, it, was my, it was my first attempt at just being a complete idiot. I spent about 25 minutes in this position, which is ridiculous. I'm so mad at myself, but this is just the beginning of the uh, circus. So, basically, um, I was going to go knight d7. And then I realized he's going to go b4. And I was like, okay, what's so scary about that? Like, okay, I can't go here, but I'll go here. Now he can't put anything on c4. And I was like, well, he's going to go a4. And I was like, yeah, but then I'm going to go a5. And then if he goes b5, I have this genius idea to go to that square. I'm going to go here. I calculated all this in advance. And I was like, well, you know, analyzing all these different options here. Bishop a3 to cover. I'll play bishop back in some positions. And then I was like, what if he goes here, here, and this move? 
and sacrifices the C pawn, which he, which he's now able to play this move because he pushed the pawn in front of that diagonal. A move ago, he can't play that because I would just take it with my bishop. And I have to calculate this, you know, six, seven moves in advance. And I'm like, well, you know, we're going to get this position. Like, think about that. I've just calculated quite literally eight moves into the future for both sides. So 16 ply. Um, and I got to this position. I was like, this looks a little unpleasant. Like he's got more space, open C file. I don't like this position. Computer says 0.00, .00 and you're a clown. Um, but it's still a very unpleasant position as far as I'm concerned. So when I realized my main plan didn't work, I started thinking, well, what does he want? He wants to play before, so obviously I should play A5. But then I started thinking of a whole bunch of other stuff. I was like, A5, oh my God, he's gonna get Knight C4. Now if I go Knight D7, he goes here and I can't do anything. And then it dawned on me, that I suck at chess and I didn't need to spend 25 minutes. And if I play a5, which I did, which is the top computer move, and he plays knight c4, I don't go to d7, I adapt my plan and counteract the knight. I go the other way with my knight. And that's when it hit me and I was like, oh my God, and I just blitzed out a5. Then he played this move. This move shocked me because it's a bad move. <laughs> um, it's not like a blunder, but I can take his pawn and he can take my pawn and then I would move my pawn out of the way. And so now we have an imbalance. We're castled on opposite sides. Both of our bishops took pawns near whatever, the, up, the, the other side of the board. But I actually think this transformation would only benefit me, rook f8, rook f2. But you see, because I already spent so much time and he was just kind of playing fast, he felt the momentum, he was going to play the obvious moves. Again, I couldn't bring myself to play bishop takes h3. If I'm playing a lower rated player, I don't even think in this position for a second. I take on h3. Why? Because I got to beat the lower rated player, so I got to create imbalance. But I'm playing the higher rated player in this case. So I'm like, do I just stay solid? Do I let him try to self-destruct, trying to beat me? Like, what do I do? Maybe if I take the imbalance, he already... Idiot, just take the pawn. Just take the pawn and push your g-pawn. And, you know, he can play knight c4 here. I have some cool tricks. I have, like, this move giving him an extra pawn and protecting his rook, but I have this knight backwards knight move. And we might emerge in a position that looks like this, where I'm down a pawn, but my active bishop pair and open file, and he's not developed at all. Um, but I played rook e8. I didn't take the pawn. I just was solid. We traded. He played here, which is um, fine. Uh, he, he thought I could go here, actually, and just fall for the fork, but then put my rook on d1. And actually, I must say, this does look very pleasant for black. Um... But uh, I, I was like, again, I need to play fast. So I played b6, just stabilizing the structure. He played a4, and I went with my knight reroute. And I was going to route my knight to d6, a backwards knight move to apply pressure to the center, and maybe go knight c4. Now, he plays knight fd2. At this point, I'm like, okay, only black can be better here, and black can only be better if black plays the move f5. And then he played f3, because, again, I need to take space. Like, we have a totally symmetrical pawn structure, 4-3, 4-3. But I have much more active pieces. Now it's like, okay, he plays f3, trying to stabilize. Um, and now, now, now is tr This next, like, set of moves is why the video is called what it is. Because for the life of me, I could not figure out what to do here. Like, my position's great. I have everything I want. Now what? So I spent only a little bit of time and I played h5. And I played h5 because anytime you have kind of a frozen four on four like this or just frozen structure, but you're more active, you can actually use your, 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 your flank pawn as like a little sacrificial lamb. And there's going to be moments like this where you just destroy your opponent's structure and then you go and, and, and win the pawns back. And this was my whole plan. Um, he doesn't have to take, but that was kind of my plan. And also in some positions, I can play bishop h6. Not right now because it would lose a bishop, but that was the idea of h5. So he played rook d1. And here, again, like I spent like so much time on my next move, just kept ticking lower and lower and lower. And I wasn't finding the way forward. And here I missed an idea, which is so nice. And I, I felt like it was the best move and I didn't see it. And it's frustrating because my instinct is good. My instinct is at the level that it should be despite not playing classical chess that much. I was thinking about the move f4, combining it with bishop h6. And here's the point. If here, I can't just take. Like, I get the open file for my rook, but white is just up a pawn. Everything is protected by the knight. I just lost the pawn. Great job. Um, but I saw in this position that I could play this move, attacking the, the, the pawn. And I rejected this because I was like, takes, 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 I have no threats. And I'm right, in this position I, I don't have any threats. I mean, I have active pieces and maybe I'm not losing because I have knight c4, but... And then 
computer shows the way. You don't take back the pawn on e5, which is just, I, I didn't think about that. Knight c4 and black wins. You can't take because I take on d1, and uh, if you go like, I don't know, rook e1, you lose this pawn, this pawn, and the a4 pawn. So you lose this, you might lose this, and you're definitely going to lose this, and you might lose this, and I might even go in rook d3 and just uh, wolf in the hen's house or whatever. Every time I try to say this phrase in a recap, I always get it wrong. It's always a sheep's pen. I, whatever. I, it doesn't matter. There's a wolf, and he gonna, he's going to eat all the animals. Okay? So, I mean, my idea was right to play a four. I mean, he doesn't have to engage with me at all. He can just play here, and okay, I mean, but I, I still, I'm making progress with this pawn advance. But uh, again, everything was trending the wrong way. I played this move after some thought. He played this move, which I didn't even think about. I didn't even think about that he, he can try to just trade everything on that side and actually use my forward momentum against me. And then here I started playing terrible moves and spending all my time. So first I took, and then I played bishop f6. I had some giga brain idea to play like take, take, bishop h4. And I had this massive idea. It was going to be just to glue my bishop in and then play this and attack him down the f file. And then it dawned on me that I'm terrible at chess and he's just going to play rook f1. And now I don't get to play g5 because I lose my rook. And if I take and take and play g5, uh, then he just like ignores my bishop forever. It just goes here. It's like, what have I done? I don't control the f file and I've, my bishop's just in jail. I, I sent my bishop over there and I forgot about him. And I mean, at this point, folks, I'm not joking when I say like somewhere around here, like after rook h8, I have like two minutes left on my clock. The game starts with 90. I just couldn't figure out a way forward and I burned my time and I was yelling at myself, just go, just go, just go, just move, just move. It's move 26. I have two minutes to make 15 moves. On the 40th move of the game, I will get an extra 30 minutes. At this point, I was like, okay, you're an idiot. You're just gonna lose this game. I started thinking what the, what the recap title was going to be uh, and I settled on, I think, what I'm naming it, although I haven't decided yet. Um, and um, he plays rook h1. Rook h1, and um, I was like, okay, rook e8. Because I shouldn't be taking on h1, because he's going to uh, obviously take control of the file, so I back up. And folks, if you look at this position, we have a completely symmetrical structure still. Where is his only pawn break? This. And he's ready. He's beating me there. That looks very scary when you have a minute and 30 seconds on the clock and you've been playing like an idiot for the past hour. I must have said that word like 10 times this video. Um, takes. Takes. And he plays C4. And I really had to like take a deep breath here. I was like, dude, don't do anything stupid. So I played knight D4, which was the best move. And he took, took. Now he's got 40 minutes. I've got one for, you know, 11 moves. So he doesn't want me to think for a long time. So he's also trying to put the pressure on me and play fast. But that also is potentially sacrificing his own quality. Because if he thinks for 20 minutes, so do I. I'm sitting there thinking with him. So he plays this move. I take. There's nothing I can do. Takes. And here I came up with an idea to create counterplay on h2. And what I quickly calculated was the fact that if I play bishop to e5 and he plays knight to f3 attacking my bishop and stopping this, I have this beautiful move, which I knew he was going to miss. I just, I had a feeling that I don't have to do anything with my bishop. I go here. Now I guard, I'm threatening, and I'm threatening, and I'm, I'm doing very well. But the second I put this on the board, I realized it was the biggest mistake I made of the entire game because he can just allow this check, which looks unallowable if that's a word but he can go here and i check him and he just plays king g1 and now my bishop and my rook are under attack and i can go here but he just backs up and he attacks both my pieces and i lose and when i played bishop e5 my heart sank because i i i, I immediately saw knight d3 and he has like 30 minutes on the clock and he plays this i was like oh my god Ooh. so i played knight c4 um, now I'm threatening too much stuff. So he goes rook g1, which is a very nice move. Uh, anticipating this check, which is what I played, and now this is guarded. So good defense by him. Here I have a couple of bishop moves, but I decided to go here. And again, I've got a minute on the clock, even less. He can play knight back to d3, knight to b3, knight to e6. But no matter what, um, I can give him this pawn, 
and just go for these pawns. That was going to be my strategy. I have enough tactical fluidity in this position, like all these moves, but that I can kind of offset the fact that I've got a weak pawn and everything. It's very important not to blunder. And, you know, I was like looking at moves like c5, which look good, but knight c5 is just terrible because he takes. And I take, and he goes rook c1. And incredibly, with a minute on the clock versus like 35, I started just, I, had, I, I grew a third eye, whatever. Seventh, eighth sense, eighth, I, whatever, some anime thing. Sharingan, I, that's just a buzzword I know from Naruto. Um, I, I just started seeing everything. I was like, oh my God, like C5, Knight C5. Okay, okay, heart is pounding. I wouldn't be shocked if I was like 130, 140 heart rate at this point. He goes here. And I, against this move, I anticipated that I have Knight to C4. I'm still threatening a lot of stuff. First of all, I'm threatening to push. Like if he plays this, just guarding, I'm just gonna go D3. Now he can't take me. And I'm in business. I'm very happy here. He takes. I take. He goes here. I'm like, wait a minute. What? What's he doing? And I realized he set a really nasty trap here. This is very gross. The trap is this. If I were to play like knight c3, he takes. And if I take with check, he goes here. And I can't stop rook here. And I can't stop my knight from getting taken. If I go rook e8 to guard my knight, he checks me. Wins my rook and wins my knight. And I saw that. I was like, oh, this dude is so dirty. He played rook. I saw this. And I realized um, if I also play knight c3, he can go here. I'm like, oh, my God, he's attacking my bishop. And then he's going to take a5. This is very scary. Um, but then I found this move, knight c5. And he told me after the game he missed this. And the whole point is he can't go here because now this move comes with check. Knights are so tricky, if, even in classical, but in, in low time especially. Now he takes, and I just have to not blunder that. And I found the final move, which is just rook e8. And um, his best thing now is to give me a check, which he did, and he offered me a draw. And he offered me a draw because it's move 40. So when I go here, I get 30 minutes, takes, takes. And this is a draw because, first of all, if I lose all my pieces just for the pawns, king and two knights versus king is just a draw. So he has a really unfortunate pair of pieces. I can just sack both my pieces for his pawns. Um, but, I mean, I could do anything here. I can play knight d7. He's not going to win this. I mean, I, I'm stupid, but not this, not stupid enough to lose this game. And I held. And, um, you know, the summary of this game is an interesting one because the opening I was very happy with. This is the first time in my life I played this G6 move. Um, and I got, like, a pretty decent position. Um, and I was kind of shocked that he allowed, you know, he didn't, he didn't like, change it up. Like, I don't know, he, I thought he was going to maybe play D4. Or he was going to play, like, E4, D4 on one of the earlier moves. Um... But then he just didn't do any of that. And um, I just got a totally reasonable position and traded queens. And I was basically in no danger of losing except for this move knight to d3. So, um, yeah. I made that significantly more exciting than I had to. Uh, and hopefully I continue to provide you entertainment if you were watching that live. One minute versus 40 to make 15 moves and not lose the game. Uh, and uh, Nicholas, now you know the name of the, uh, the video. He asked me af after what I was going to name the video, so... I named it, uh, I named it what I named it. I'll see you all in round seven. Uh, and uh, hopefully a little bit less stressful next time.